um, uh, if you would like to grab a bite or something like that, we'll continue the uh, the presentation with our next presenter, uh, uh, please, Ivanko, and he will uh, talk about resistant Balmer amaranth control. Please. Hello, everybody. I am Blaze Ivancho. I work out of the Pinal County office, and I cover uh, field crop production and field crop agronomy for Pima and Pinal counties. So I will try to speed us up here a little bit and go over this program that we're putting out this summer to uh, really work on starting to control our, our resistant Palmer amaranth problem, which you could clearly see in that bottom picture. So let's see. Let's see, she don't want to move. There we go. Okay, so we clearly have problems with Palmer amaranth and basically all of our production areas across the state and in all of our all of our cropping systems. It has been uh, found by Bill McCloskey and and confirmed in pecans, alfalfa, um, cotton, corn, and there are others following on its back, such as hairy fleabane, which is which is also resistant to glyphosate, and our uh, glyphosate resistant Palmer populations are also carrying some secondary uh, resistance to our ALS inhibitors. So the problem is bad and getting worse. And I think everybody already understands that and knows it, but uh, it's it's here. Here we see a field in Marana from two years ago, which you could clearly see if you're out there where the where a piece of equipment hit a uh, hit a small group of of resistant Palmer spread it in that area and then basically created a whole strip down the side and the rest of the field. And then just after these two rows on the end, the rest of the entire field is clear. Here further up the road, uh, we come into Coolidge. Now in Coolidge, there's so many problems uh, and fields populated with resistant Palmer that it's almost, almost difficult to find one that's not. Uh, but there are. there are, there are fields throughout all these areas that can be controlled with growers that have, have really jumped on it and taken, taken it out early in the system and early in the problem. Further down the road and uh, heading into Casa Grande from Coolidge, you come across this field. A uh, field on the right there you could see clearly has some uh, a pretty large population. I would say probably 30 to 40 percent of that field is infested and this is late season. But then 25 feet across that that road there are very few. There are maybe maybe a dozen or so escapes in the field just 25 feet away, showing how it can be controlled and really how your equipment could spread it throughout a field and it can really blow up in one field very fast. And then last one I have here is over in Goodyear where Bill McCloskey first confirmed our resistant populations. Uh, and you can see this field was sprayed three times and it just did not, uh, did not take to the, the glyphosate at all. <clears throat> so our Palmer really is a it's a it's a hardy plant C4 plant which we'll discuss here in a sec. Um, it, it grows tons of seeds. Uh, a plant growing like this one alone by itself can produce 600 to one and a half million seeds. So those those seeds just one plant could produce enough to really affect the whole field. <clears throat> the uh, many of these plants together they produce fewer seeds but but drop as a group more and more. So you see, we could have 375 million seeds in a row in a foot of row crop, which when you get to that point, it becomes harder and harder to control. Their uh, seed bank longevity is really unknown. A, a 17 year study showed that there was still a little bit of viability after their, their last test on it. But the good news is it does go down in, in viability fairly quickly in those first couple years with a loss of 80% of its viability after only three but you still have that 17 years where you're gonna get some of those plants to pop up. So we know that there are, it's a dioecious plant. So there are male and female plants out there in your fields and ditch banks and just growing in the native, native as it is a native to this, uh, the desert Southwest. You could tell the males and females when they're flowering easily by the yellow anther sacs on the, on the males. And then the females are just really spiny. So they're obligate outcrossers, meaning they really, they don't self-pollinate at all. So they're always getting new genetic material from other plants. And the new genetic material, which can be resistant, can come to your field in form of pollen or seed. So it could be stuck on a piece of equipment as a seed that's resistant, 
or some pollen can blow in the wind and pollinate a plant that is left to go to, go to flower in your field. And then you end up with a whole, uh, whole plant in your field that is resistant. And when you get those resistant plants in your field, they start affecting your cotton crop almost immediately. They, as you can see here, you have two leaf cotton, very small cotton, and it can be overshadowed and shaded out and uh, drained of nutrients by these really fast growing plants in and around your cotton. So it's, that's why it's important to get them out early so they don't affect your crop. It's also important to get them out early because the bigger they get, the harder and harder and harder they become to control. So as I mentioned Palmer being a C4 plant. What this means is its ability to fix carbon dioxide and produce photosynthates is exponentially more than, than, uh, than cotton. So you're coming in at 2.3 uh, times the rate of carbon fixation for these plants. That's why when you get them in the field, say you do a late planting, you're putting them in in June, you have a population of Palmer out there, they germinate at the same time, it's real hot and man, those, those Palmer plants can just take off. They're real efficient water users, they love the hot weather, and they can, they can grow like lightning. <clears throat> and then when they grow like lightning and they produce seeds just as much, you could really end up with a problem quick. So this study uh, was done in the Southeast when they, when they first started getting very large problems of resistant Palmer by Norseworthy. Really what they're trying to understand is how quickly a field can be inundated by resistant Palmer. So here you see what they basically did. On the right there, you have an outline of this field that they it basically in graph form. And then they, at the south end of the field, which is where the irrigation water came in, they, they put in a one square meter, 20,000 seeds of resistant Palmer. And just basically modeled them and watched what they did over the year. So you can see this is at the end of the first, first year, they found a, quite a, Small population, but a population indeed at the head of the field where they put the seeds in. Down at the other end of the field, likely carried by irrigation water, there were several other plants. There was no yield loss uh, seen, but as you move into the second year, you could see as those plants spread and grew, they shed quite a bit of, quite a bit of seed over that, that field. So this field is shown the second year, shows the initial spot at the bottom, south end of that field where they put seed in, and man, were those first couple of seeds at the other end of the field that kind of exploded and then they spread out to the rest of the field. Now this looks an awful lot like that field that I showed you guys just a few minutes ago that I picture I took earlier in Casa Grande. There's strips and pots all over the place, but it's not completely inundated yet. So they had a small yield loss, 42 pounds per acre. So some people might think, oh, it's only 42 pounds. We still have this under control. Um, and they may resist taking more, more invasive actions to get rid of these plants, which is a bad idea. Because at the end of your third year, you see here on the right, there is no graph showing yield or plant populations because the field was, was unpassable. It's completely loaded with Palmer amaranth and there's basically a complete yield loss. So just like that in three years of only using a glyphosate over the top, they went from a zero seed loss or zero yield loss to complete field loss, just three seasons. So it happens fast and it can take you out. So we've, Bill McCloskey's uh, as well as many uh, weed scientists across the country have you know, kind of gone with the IPM strategies. There's all sorts of different things that we can do uh, using different, different crop chemistries. So taking advantage of your 2,4-D resistant crops, your uh, dicamba resistance, your glyphosate resistance, your glufosinate resistance spraying those small weeds and really being on top of it. Uh, then you get into your tillage, which really has, has seemed to have gone more and more to the wayside until people run into a real big problem that they know they have to get their equipment in, uh, which it's, you know, it's almost too late at that point. Then you're in a, then you're in a recovery mode. <clears throat> and then there's all sorts of cultural, cultural practices that you can do uh, to really try to rotate out so you could use even more chemistry with say different crops instead of just cotton on cotton um, fertilizing just so your cotton crop is getting that fertilizer and you're not just liquid running and feeding the whole field and then really trying to maybe bunch your crop up a little bit so your canopy closes faster and you have a, you have better suppression of weeds coming up after after your first or second application of herbicide so there's all these things that we can do and have been put out 
right. but it seems that uh, there's still been a large reliance on our over-the-top chemistry and our uh, growers kind of unwillingness to, to use our pre-plant herbicides. So I think this is really an area where we can make some leaps and bounds. As you'll see here, we have tons of data on putting our pre-plant pre incorporated herbicides down in the ground. You don't need to really see any of the data when you see a picture like this. This is an experiment Bill did just a couple years ago, just showing, the, just showing how effective it is when you use these pre-plant incorporated herbicides. That plot right there you're looking at closest to the screen has such a low population of Palmer amaranth compared to just 50 feet down where you see a complete inundation of Palmer. So if you know you have a problem out there in that field and you're not willing to do too much, pre-plant incorporated herbicides really need to be your first step in starting to control your problem and solve your problem. Uh, we're uh, starting to populate several different documents so that we can get information out. Bill has done so many field studies over the years, tested so many chemicals and mixes that uh, he's just loaded with, loaded with information and we're gonna try to start to package that and deliver it to everyone. So we have these, we're gonna develop some quick reference tables as you can see here of where to go, what to use and what's worked best in our, in our studies, as well as some general information as you see in the bottom right uh, to get people to live a little bit more into it and willing to hopefully take on some of these more, more invasive tactics to get this plant and pest out of our fields. So you should be looking for those soon. We have, I've developed this winter, this Palmer Amaranth Task Force. So I'm working with our industry players, uh, all of our seed companies, Arizona Pest Management Center, Cotton Protection Council, and cotton growers to really hopefully develop a plan that everybody can agree on to start to get this pest out of our fields. Um, it's just popped up everywhere. And I think if we don't act now, it may even be too late already, but if we don't act now, we're certainly going to lose lose our ability to control this pest. So what we're doing is you saw in a couple of former slides, we're really trying to develop some more information, quick read, quick lookup tables to be able to control it and contain the pest. Uh, with the help of Arizona Cotton Research and Protection Council, we are gonna ma uh, map and monitor and really develop an inventory of where this pest is the worst and how much of it we have and see where we need to focus our efforts most on and then working with these kind of seed companies to try to incentivize some of these IPM tools like pre-emerge herbicide so that we can get as many growers on board and, and start to control some of these acreage before, we, before it's too late. So I just wanna thank everybody that's helping me and working with me on this project. And hopefully we can make a dent in this, in this problem and we'll still have a uh, land to go to our kids and grandkids and everybody else that's not completely inundated with resistant weeds. So I thank you for your time and listening. And if there's any questions, pop them in the box and I'll get to them. Thank you, please. And um, again, the questions can be uh, all the time be 